Well, I always wanted to do that. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Wow. There's a lot of people here. This is so cool. I think it's the biggest concert I've had yet. This is wonderful. Yeah. I love that people are willing to come out and be together and experience these things now together like we were meant to. Yeah. This is really gorgeous. Uh, there's a few single seats open still if you can find them. or it's, uh, There's some chairs there you can fill up the aisles with too. Uh, so you're good to go there. Um, things about the house, there's two bathrooms, one upstairs, one through the kitchen, downstairs, down the stairs. There's a lot of new faces here, which is really cheers me up to see some new, new faces here. I love it. I love it. I love it. We're going to pass around the mailing list. You can get my mail list for what's coming up next. And what's coming up next, uh, middle of May, on a weeknight, on a Wednesday night, I've got Alan Murray and Andrew Finn McGill coming. They are some of the best Irish musicians in the country. That will be an amazing show. Um, I, Andrew has been, a, I've been a fan of his for years and years. I have many of his CDs and just He's very inspiring to listen to and one of the best accompanists around. These people have played with everybody famous in Irish music everywhere. So they've been around a while. Um, in June, I have a concert, Sprig of That, from Minneapolis. They are another Irish band, but with an Indian tabla player. Ooh. Oh, wow. Oh. And it works amazingly. <laughs> so, an amazing sound. When I heard them, I said, this is too cool to not have here. <laughs> so I'm really thrilled about them. Then in July, uh, July 10th, another midweek concert, I've got Derek Gripper from South Africa coming. Oh, wow. He is a guitarist who plays in a West African chorus style. Oh. Nobody else does this. Wow. It is a, a very unusual, odd, oh, it's a sound, and he's famous in South Africa. And we were, we were in Hawaii, and there was some guy from South Africa that I mentioned, Derek Gripper. You got Derek Gripper coming? Are you kidding? He's a big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he ought to be playing Meaty Hall. Oh. He's playing here. <laughs> That's going to be an amazing show. Uh, so that I'm excited about. And um, at some point, we're doing a kitchen remodel in the fall, so I'm going to have to skip that one just for a little while when we figure out how to make our meals. Uh, but, and then we're going to Australia in November, so we won't have any then. Um, but other than that, I am pleased to have one of my musical heroes here. Mm -hmm. Neil Perlman, mm -hmm. who I mostly know him as playing with Katie McNally in uh, Duel, but he plays with about, what, 16 different bands because he's that kind of professional mm -hmm. musician who everybody wants right. to have their back, doing their backup. This is his first solo project, I believe, he's touring with that I'm excited to hear. I was with uh, Neil last summer at Valley of the Moon and picked up some Cape Breton styling things, and I'm still trying to figure out how the hell that syncopation happens, but you're going to hear so much of that tonight with this amazing jazz background that he has that he brings to it. It's very creative, it's very inspiring, it will just awe you with the virtuosity. Let me welcome you.
Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we were deciding whether the piano should be open or closed, and it's very different in the room with a lot of people in. So if, the people, if you're in the back there, it feels a little quiet, you can let, let us know, and we can adjust for that. Um, obviously, that was supposed to be quiet, though. <laughs> so um, I am very excited to be uh, here, very excited to be releasing my first solo piano album with this tour. Um, this is the first, very first leg of the tour, so the official release date isn't for another, well, not quite a week now. On May 5th is when it comes out. You can celebrate Cinco de Mayo with some Gaelic music. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's, if you listen, uh, uh, if you per prefer to listen online, streaming or downloads or things like that, you'll have to wait till then. But I do have the CD with me. It's in the back, um, just next to the door there. And it's called Refractions. And uh, I grew up playing Scottish and Cape Breton music. It's, um, it's in my family. And, uh, and as Doug mentioned, I have a, a lot of, also a love of jazz piano. And so those are the kind of the two threads that I've, been tying together in my music, musical life um, for the last few decades at this point. And um, so with this album, with this idea of just doing, doing something totally solo, I decided to go, go to the, the traditional source material and find particularly, primarily Scottish Gaelic melodies, song melodies um, that uh, inspired me and then explore them. So uh, Refractions is kind of a collection of different traditional melodies refracted through the piano and my own voice and they go in different directions depending on where 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 a different melody led me so um that uh piece i just played the tune i just played is a i got it from a collection that didn't really um didn't really do a good job of translating its titles so i was kind of looking through the collection looking at titles that were interesting to me and then tried exactly. started playing that tune to see if it was inter if it was any good and this one I picked for the title, but then when I went and looked at the actual Gaelic title, it's not well translated. The title was translated as The Brown-Haired Youth Perplexes Me, <laughs> which I thought was great. <laughs> it's, actually more, it's actually more accurately, The Brown-Haired Lad is My Darling. But, you know, <laughs> Both can be true. it's not such a bad translation after all, perhaps. <laughs> I'm gonna do another one from that that I got from like on the, from the same page in fact of that book. Again, it was translated in that book as uh, the lover's solicitude, but mm. it's a little more about um, I am full of care, or I'm full of woe, or the lover's depression. But um, solicitude <laughs> is an interesting word to me also. So, so there's perplexity and solicitude. <laughs>
All right. Well, um, so as I mentioned, this collection I got the first two out of. I, I pretty, you know, it's one of these projects you can kind of dig into a bit uh, with the extra time at home with no gigs for a little while in the, the last couple of years. Um, so I, I got the chance to dig into a few different collections and find different source material. So another place that I got a couple of melodies uh, for this project from, um, where the, ne the next tune I'm going to play for you is from this incredible book called The Songs of Gaelic Scotland. If any of you are interested uh, in, in um, Scottish music, Gaelic music, and um, want to check it out, I really highly recommend this particular book. It's big. It's, by, it's written by Anne Lorne Gillies, who's, a, who's an incredible knowledge bearer of that tradition, and um, has tons of really interesting information, stories about uh, all these songs, in, like inter information about the tradition, the traditions of, of different like you know work songs versus you know um, elegies and various things like that. Anyway, uh, this is one of my favorite songs that I found in that book. It's a lament for a hero, a Gaelic hero called Ian Garth MacLeod, and um, there's lots and lots of stories, of course, with traditional music, uh, and uh, this one I think is worth me taking a minute to, to tell you about because I just was quite, quite captivated by uh, what she wrote in there about it. Um, and it's part of what makes the tune speak to me even more. Is that so? It's a lament for this guy, and it's uh, it was written by his sister, and I guess his sister, the story goes, wrote a new lament for him every Friday for a year after he died. But this is the only one we have, so this, and a lot of what I'm about to tell you seems like it, it may have been embellished a bit. So that, this could be part of the embellishment just to like, that, that, that sort of just illustrates how much he was missed. Um, but he, uh, he, he definitely actually existed, but he also has become a bit of a mythical figure in some ways. Um, the story goes that he was prophesied to not be able to be killed by the sword. Um, he died when his ship sank um, with a bunch of his men on board going across to visit a different clan um, on the Isles. And uh, the story goes that the boat sank because a rival clan chief, knowing he couldn't be killed by the sword, hired a group of witches to sink his boat. <laughs> um, which makes sense. And as the... Uh, <laughs> and I was particularly, you know, I, it's a very interesting story. There's a whole story around that. But I got kind of sidetracked by being interested in, in the witches because <laughs> in the book, all, there's a whole bunch of witches and they are, all have different names that are really evocative, that are more like, more like than like a name of a person, more like they imply a story, like Yellow Paw or Foot in Brindled Stocking <laughs> is the name of one of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Hag of the Hollow. There's like all of these very, I mean, these are all translations, obviously, um, of the Gaelic names, and they all have different places that they're from. So I thought there must be legends about each of them, and then there's sort of this Avengers story where they all come together. Um, <laughs> but I haven't found, been able to find, track in any more individual stories about them, but I'm trying to, so I'm spreading the word. You know, if you know anything about Yellow Paw, let me know. Um, uh, anyway, the, the, the extra little bit that's fun about it is that um, what what she writes in the book is that, uh, is that the, it, these were the natural witches to hire for this job of sinking his ship because <laughs> everyone knows that they're the same witches that were hired by the English to sink the Spanish Armada <laughs> beforehand. So it's kind of their specialty. And, uh, it's not really, it's only not in the history books because it was airbrushed out by Anglish, ang Anglo-centric historians. This is, <laughs> so apparently it's common knowledge uh, in the Gaelic tradition. So anyway, <laughs> this is a, this is my interpretation of uh, of the lament for Ian Garth MacLeod. You can you can envision as much of that as you like. <laughs>
So the, one of the joys of house concerts, of course, is that we can be more informal, conversational. If there are any questions or anything through the evening, I am happy to hear them and uh, chat about it. Um, so feel free. But I'm going to uh, I'm going to continue with the the sort of the other thread of Scottish music that uh, that I'm most most going to draw on tonight, sec second to the Gaelic tradition, and that's uh, bagpipe music. Um, <laughs> Because I can't resist playing some pipe tunes, I love them. Um, I love I love the tunes that are written for the pipes. I love 
The Sound of the Pipes 2, um, which might be controversial for some of you, but <laughs> I tend to do. Um, and I, I think that the piano actually lends itself very well to pipe tunes because uh, it has this sort of, especially a bright piano like this, has such a like sparkly, crisp high end, and it, 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 it gets a similar effect sometimes with the, or with the intricate ornamentation and things. So um, I'm going to play a, a pipe march right now, sort of that links those, these two repertoires a little bit because it was written by a Gaelic singer. So it's a fairly recently composed pipe march written by the singer Marianne Kennedy. It's called John MacDonald of Colview, and she wrote it um, for a BBC documentary about this guy, John MacDonald, uh, who sacrificed his life in World War I to save another, another soldier. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it just, it's just a really lovely pipe march, and I love playing it. <coughs> bending them a lot. Yeah. Uh, well, that's actually uh, you, a very good question for the next tune I'm going to do. Th thank you for setting that up well. <laughs> um, it's basically, uh, it's, it's quite a case-by-case -case thing. Uh, the, sort of hence my deciding to title the tune Refractions. I feel like they go off in all these different directions, but um, or the album Refractions. But uh, some of them, some of these tunes I'm just, I find the melody just very inspiring to improvise from, and so I don't do a lot of very explicit shaping, more of a general shape that I have in mind and spaces to go off into the woods and come back to it. <laughs> um, and some of them are a little bit more, more planned out uh, with specific ideas or with source material. So um, I, don't, I don't really know at all beyond maybe one or two things that I'm going to do when I play that pipe tune. I just want to play it. Um, but the, the next one I'm going to do, I've done a bit more thinking about, um, planning about. It's a song um, that I got from the singing of uh, Margaret Stewart, a great um, Gaelic singer from the Isle of Lewis, um, another one of the, the real experts alive today in, in the tradition. And there's a Gaelic singer I uh, recorded an album with 
had a band with uh, called Farson. Um, Mari, Mari Britton is her name, and when we recorded that album, Mari, who has, she's not a, she's not from a Gaelic-speaking part of Scotland, she's from Edinburgh, but she grew up speaking, like learning to speak Gaelic, and has been speaking it her, her whole life, and teaches as a professor of it in, uh, in Nova Scotia now. Um, she recorded herself singing all of the songs and sent them the voice recordings to Margaret Stewart to make sure that, that she was pronouncing them okay. <laughs> Um, so that's like kind of <laughs> Margaret Stewart's stat, stat, status in the like in the Gaelic music scene. But I got this um, this next one I'm going to play from an album of hers, and I wanted to kind of explore a little bit what what was out there as far as this song goes. So there was this album, and I love this version. But I went uh, into some audio archives. There's an incredible, another incredible resource uh, I'll share for the music nerds out there called Tober and Dolphus. Um, I can spell that for you if you need. But uh, it's it's basically an online archive, completely made available, completely for free, of all of these field recordings from uh, all across Scotland, in particular Gaelic Scotland. Um, that were made in the last hundred years, an incredible resource. Um, and so I went in and looked up this song and found a whole bunch of recordings of it from different people in different places. And uh, there's some interesting differences between different people's interpretations of how to sing it in the melody. So I gathered together a couple of different versions that I liked and uh, sort of put them together into this arrangement. And um, we'll probably do my own interpretation in there too.
So I'm going to give you just a couple more and then we'll take a little bit of a break and get some fresh air, refresh your refreshments if you're inclined. Uh, give you two more here. So uh, going back to bagpipes here, I'm just going to play another pipe march that I have been playing for a long time. I just find it to be one of the most continually inspiring ones for me to, to improvise around. about bagpipe tunes is how uh, motivic they are. They have these small little um, melodic motifs that repeat or, or get like varied through the tune already. And I think that, that with, a, with a tune like that, that there's, I don't know, something about the melody and the motifs that are used in that melody are really 
uh, interesting to me continually, no matter how many times I play it. And so um, those, it's fun for me to then take those motifs and further like jump off from them. So like I really like this one like, for some reason. And then I feel like those two building off of each other are really interesting. So it's fun to sometimes, uh, I basically the shape in my head for doing that in a broad sense for, for performing that is I'm going to play it like pretty straightforwardly the first time and there's four parts so I'm going to play the four parts pretty straightforwardly and then each time I'm going to get a little bit <laughs> more free with what I do with the first few parts but I'm going to come back at the ending part as kind of a chorus to, yeah. to bring it back home so that's kind of what I'm thinking about and I'm yeah. like allowing myself to, to explore some of those whatever motif is interesting to me this time around a little bit more each time and leave the key a little bit more as it goes so yeah to <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to do one more, and then we'll take a break, uh, and there's another just a, a pair of pipe tunes, and I just want to mention, you know, the CV is over there. I also have a, uh, a notebook with an email list you can sign up for there. Um, I, I do a lot, I put out a lot of stuff that's not, not just, I don't send out a ton of emails, but I am putting out a lot of stuff on the internet as far as music, and I have a podcast as well, so there's, there's material I'm putting out that might be interesting to you, even if, uh, even if I'm only coming out here once or twice a year for, for live gigs. So, um, and also you'll you'd get a notification that way when it come, when the CD comes out next week online to listen to it there. So um, love to have you sign up for the mailing list if you're interested, but the CD is there as well. And one other thing that I, uh, I put over there, um, Doug was mentioning that he got into the, the online sessions that Katie McNally and I were running during the pandemic. And there may be some other musicians in the audience who were, were joining us for that. Katie and I have been running uh, a Scottish um, and Cape Breton tune session in Boston for many years. And we've start, come to do this thing at the end of it called Last Call, um, where we just we say, OK, we're going to do one more set of tunes. If there's any tunes that you haven't had a chance to play tonight, you know, call them all out and I'll try to fit them all into one set. <laughs> um, <laughs> and even if it's very disjointed, we'll try to hit the, them all. So I'm doing some sort of version of that for my show here. I have a little last, I have a little cocktail shaker there and a little uh, stack of um, memo, memo pad there. And uh, if you have a tune that you'd, li you'd like to hear me sort of mess around with for the last number of the show, you can toss it into the cocktail shaker. I'm going to shake it up and pull one or two out. And uh, if I know them, well enough to, to 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 use them, I will I'll do that. So that's going to be kind of the end of the show. So feel free to toss something in. It won't be very fun to shake up if there's only one piece of paper in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> and if I don't know it, that's not a problem. I just will pull another one out. So um, yeah. Anyway, here's a couple of <coughs> pipe tunes. The first the first one is a is a march written um, by a piper from the Western Isles of Scotland for a fiddler from out there. The, the, so it's called George McCarty, which is the name of the fiddler it was written for, um, who was a great fiddle teacher. Also, he taught, um, if any of you know the fiddler Aidan O'Rourke, he was Aidan O'Rourke's fiddle teacher. Um, so I'm going to play that march that was written for him and then finish with a jig, uh, an old traditional jig. It's made its way into a bunch of different fiddle traditions, actually. Um, so you may, it may be familiar to you uh, if you're a fiddler, and, but you know a different name than this. This is the Scottish piping version. It has a perplexing title. It's called The Rock and the Wee Pickle Toe. So <laughs> if you know what that means, feel free to tell me. <laughs> Thank you. 
will come back together. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you haven't put your money in, your, uh, money in here yet, uh, this is the basket. Uh, nice night outside if you want to go outside and get some room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some drinks in the kitchen, and some, in the corner there's lots of drinks in there. Yeah, Is this okay in your video? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I have two feelings about this. Is how does he do this? Does how does he do this? And is he allowed to do this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you are so going. He's going places with this. It's just astounding to watch. Welcome. Neil will play for till. Yeah. Yeah. Until the end. <laughs> That's right. And at the end, you have a lot of new people here. The tradition is you help carry chairs downstairs. Yeah. We like tradition. Yes, okay. If you're old and broken, you don't have to. So I don't have to. <laughs>
find, uh, just to kick things off. Um, kind of messing around with the bagpipe tune uh, sort of limits without, well, but with a different sound. So it's, it's in the same, I was, I didn't actually mention, you know, one of the interesting things about the bagpipes being how limited they are as an instrument. They, on, they only have nine notes. They can't uh, modulate volume. They're just the same volume the whole time. <laughs> they also can't stop playing. <laughs> it's just one, they have to have a sound going at all times. So, you know, that's part of why the tunes are so intricate and interesting, because that's what they have <laughs> to, to create interest with. Um, so it was, yeah, that, that was a tune I wrote uh, thinking about how, if I wasn't, if I'm using those limitations, but on an instrument that's not the bagpipes, what sounds could I make? So they could be played on a bagpipe, that tune, but it doesn't really sound like it. <laughs> and I wrote it for a friend of mine who lives in Spain, because I wrote, I wrote it on his piano and I gave it to him. So it's in a little village called Tristan in Galicia, so it's called the Tristan's Tour Guide. <laughs> um, and back now to our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, I'm going to play uh, a couple of Gaelic songs. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> the, this is a, a bit of a, a, it's a pairing of songs that kind of it illustrates or kind of shows the, the two different things going on in my playing with regard to Scottish music. There's a, a Cape Breton song and a Scottish song. Um, and there was a question at the break about the link between Cape Breton and Scotland, which um, you know some people here may know, but um, just make sure we're on the same page. Cape Breton is a island, um, sort of the northern third of Nova Scotia, the west, east coast of Canada. Um, and it's a place that a lot of Gaelic-speaking Scottish immigrants went when they were kicked off their land a couple hundred years ago. And because it's so remote, um, they held on to their culture um, and didn't assimilate uh, like the ones that went to Appalachia did, in this, or in the same way. So there's a very strong tradition there. Um, there are still Gaelic speakers there um, today. And they it's kind of an interesting, interesting to see how the Scottish music tradition has evolved in parallel and separately in, in the two places. There's things that have survived in one place and not the other place. The wa waves have gone different directions. Mm -hmm. You know, the piano is, a, is the primary accompaniment instrument in Cape Breton and yeah. uh, not so in Scotland. There are pianists in Scotland, but it's not as primary. Mm -hmm. So um, and you, that's, that's, that's the connection there. And, um, and I grew up very influenced by Cape Breton piano players. So. Um, so this first song is was written by, it's one of the first songs ever written on Cape Breton by one of that first generation of immigrants, um, and it's just describing the beauty of Cape Breton. And I'm going to go into one of my fav very favorite Gaelic songs called Biog an Jok Show Live Maroon. Um, I know this is recorded, so I'm sorry to the Gaelic speakers <laughs> for my very American accent there, but um, uh means the drink would be in my love's hand. It's just a beautiful love song, and I got it from the singing of Julie Fallis, who, if you are interested in Gaelic music and don't know, you should definitely look her up. She's great, great. Um, she's recorded many, many albums, and they're all great, um, <laughs> of, of really lovely Gaelic songs. Thank you. 
just an absolutely beautiful song. Um, I yeah, can't get can't get enough of that song. Um, all right, what do I have here? Oh, I'm gonna do another song. Um, not a lot to say about this one as much as the others. It's a, it's another beautiful song. It's just a sailor singing about his boat. <laughs> beautiful love song as well. <laughs>
of the night. <laughs> Unless we'll see what's in last call, but <laughs> not a fan of fiddle tunes. <laughs> um, I mean, many of the tunes I've played could be played on the fiddle, but the only one that is from directly a fiddle tune, um, written by a fiddler, really only could be played or should be played on the fiddle. And I'm going to play on the piano. Now. Um, but this is a, a Cape Breton tune written by Gary Holland called "Wheel for Carl." Um, and uh, for, for the great fiddler, Carl McKenzie. Um, and just a tune that I've loved ever since I learned it and have been working for a while on some ideas uh, of a piano arrangement for it. And then I was doing a solo album that made sense to, to do it on this. So uh, I'm just finally finished up the ideas. So. fingers break there and play a tune um, back to the song melodies but this is a tune that I associate with my dad's fiddle playing so it's a slow air that I 
grew up hearing him play called Lachlan Du, um, which is just, Lachlan is a, is a person's name, and Du would mean sort of dark-haired, dark-eyed. So it's, I think it's probably a lament for Lachlan. Thank you. 
Well, I think if I'm reading this right, I'm down to the last number here. So I really Aww. appreciate, well, <laughs> I really, really appreciate you all coming here and making this such a great evening. Um, <coughs> Uh, it really feels like a great way to start sending sending off my album into the world. It's just the third gig of uh, a month of gigs for this, so uh, thank you for oh, wow. helping me get this started. And thank you so much to Doug for organizing everything, hosting. Uh, it only works if you're here. <laughs> <laughs> we really need live music. Uh, in this world, and uh, we appreciate—I mean, I, I appreciate it more than ever now, of course. And um, we need people doing things like this. So I hope you—if you—if it's your first time here, I hope you come back. I hope you support the things that, that Doug's doing. Yeah. Did you yeah, narrate your tune? There is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There is What's that? It didn't you narrate anything. your tunes on the on the on the, on the, on the CD? <laughs> I do not. I don't. I don't have an audio recording of myself talking about it, but I do have. Uh, liner notes where I just I talk about I wrote I write down the stories yeah some of, some of the relevant information Did yeah. you record on a grand piano yes I recorded it um I recorded it on a piano in uh, England actually um in Northumberland uh there's a there's a beautiful I guess uh, no, I'm, this is a Doug's mailing list going around I think um, but I recorded the album on a on a beautiful Yamaha grand piano in a in an old village hall in rural Northumberland. Um, that I I just found that this piano is one of my one of my favorite pianos to play. I like Yamaha grands; they're bright and sparkly, and um, this one's really nice. And the room's nice. And worked with a really wonderful recording engineer who happens to also be just a fantastic musician um, named Ian Stevenson. He's written written some tunes that are uh, actually become pretty popular. Um, and he's uh, been in some great bands, but also happens to be a great engineer. So it was a great time. It was a great experience. It was also a really terrifying experience <laughs> to be, <laughs> to just kind of stare into your own soul, creative soul for three days straight. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody to hide behind, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I guess we're going to do last call here. Let's shake this thing up. It seems like there was a lot of stuff in here, so I'm sorry. To, I can't. I can't. I don't think I can do them all. That would be a lot. Anybody? What's that? Anybody need to fill that out? Yes, we have a, a mailing list here for the house concerts. Make sure you don't go without signing up for that. And let's see. Does someone want to pick for me, or do I? Yeah, pick something out. All right, blue seventy six. <laughs> oh man! All right, Bohemian Rhapsody. I knew what I was getting into here, I suppose. Well, yes, I, I'm not going to only, I might try to quote it somewhere in there. <laughs> I'm not going to play what you mean, Rhapsody. That's one I would actually have to have learned, I think. <laughs> Dale Among the Tailors, great. Can throw that in. Let's get a couple more, at least one more. Sleepy Maggie, oh, we got reels, okay. Yeah. All right. Somebody said more fiddle tunes, that's what it's gonna be, I think. <laughs> Neil Gow's Lament for the Death of His Second Wife. All right, that's a good three. What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Neil Gow's Lament on the Death of His Second Wife. Um, Anybody? What? Oh, yeah, mailing list. Um, and then these two reels, Sleepy Maggie, Dale Among the Tailors. Um, and before before I embarrass myself, let me make sure I'm, I'm thinking of the right Neil Gow Lament. This is, that's this one, right? <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. This has really been great and I'd be lo lo love to hang out with you some more afterwards.